right. Welcome, everybody. I don't even know if we're going to have a separate intro or if you just rolled in cold to uh, what I'm expecting to be a really fun, really interesting and educational conversation. Today, I am joined by three non-martial artists, certainly the first time we've ever done this on our show. And the whole premise here is to cultivate some ideas for all of you around things that you might try differently in your martial arts schools. And I'm joined by three folks, and I'm going to go kind of in, in an order that, that I, I see it might show up a little bit different on your screen, but I'm going to start what looks to be below me. Myson, uh, take 30 seconds. Tell us about you, what you do, who you are. I run a basketball training business here in Greenville, South Carolina. It's called Hoops University. The motto is helping student athletes graduate to the highest degree of fulfillment. And we run camps, clinics, groups, private training lessons here in the upstate uh, as well. A lot of synergy there. All right, Kristen. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Leach. I am the executive and artistic director of New Hampshire Dance Institute in New Hampshire. We are an affiliate of the National Dance Institute in New York City. There are 13 in the country. We are an arts and education organization serving over 4,000 children in New Hampshire alone for NHDI. Um, as, so dance as part of a child's school day, that it's not exclusive to children getting to a dance studio. Um, it is also not exclusive to financial um, existence or um, body type or um, clothing. It's jeans and sneakers. We have a lot of we have a lot of hockey playing boys that love to take dance during the day at school. Um, it's a very athletic form of dance. It's very accessible, and um, it is artistic, but it also has a very um, what we call in the educational business SEL, which is social emotional learning component mm. in growing self esteem and inspiring. Um, excellence and dedication to to work ethic. Awesome. More synergy, Greg. <laughs> I, I already like this group. I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to stay connected. I know. This. Uh, I own a personal training studio in uh, Sacramento, California. Um, we predominantly focus on one-on-one -on -one training or semi-private, semi-private meeting. Only two to four people tops, so everything still has a kind of an individualized approach. Uh, most of my population is general population: weight loss, fat loss, muscle gain. But we also specialize in golf fitness, uh, and we also do a little bit of long-term athletic development with juniors. Uh, we have a my youngest is eight right now, and my oldest is just turned ninety. Uh, so I have a very wide scope of, of people. But for the most part, this is just fitness through the ages. Wow. Well, all right. And because I don't want anyone to think I'm hiding this fact, uh, Greg and I went to school together, and it was watching some of the things that he was doing that sparked the idea that led to what we're doing today. This idea that, you know, I see people doing things that on the surface might seem more different, but really it's the same. We're teaching movement for certain purposes and there's generally a financial exchange. I mean, somewhere along the way, money is changing hands and we can all get better at that which we do. So let's, let's start with this and I'll, I'll mix it up who I'm going to have start with things. What one thing have you learned this year that you wish you had known before? And I'll, I'll start with you, Kristen. Oh, start with me. What yeah. one thing have I learned this year that mm -hmm. I wish I'd known before? Um, well, I guess it's something I knew before, um, but I didn't employ as mm. much. So I have... Um, in my position, the in the organization, I've served as artistic director, where I've been um, writing stories and choreographing dances and teaching, being a teaching artist and and um, directly related to the to the children. Um, and at this point, with, within the past few months, I've stepped into the executive director position, um, which is certainly you know looking more at the the funding pieces. Um, I wish that I, again, I knew it, but I wished I'd employed it. It's getting to know the families more. I, I knew of them and I knew their stories, but now really getting to know their names and um, to use their stories and, and their experiences to um, 
for funding to to tell their story and and look at donors and foundations and and um really try to put those things together in a better way mm. um so i i knew that that was a thing but now i'm really doing it and it's really we're seeing um a lot of growth because of that that direct interaction with families great so let's let's kind of set up i don't want to call it a rule but i'll give you the flexibility so you know kristen just went greg i'm going to call on you if you want to answer the question the same question i asked her by all means or if she just said something that makes you think you know what yes i i i want to respond to that and what she said instead you're up uh man i'll i'll, I'll double down on that one i think i think getting to know the families goes a long way so that's one thing. Again, when we work with our junior golfers, thankfully, I do have the relationship with the families to where they don't they don't have to worry about me. They what we do in here may not look anything like a golf swing, but I'm not constantly being uh, judged by the parent wondering what they're doing. So, I'm like, getting to know the families of whoever you're working with is, is always great, and that's part of like relationship building as well as how are the kids, how are the sister, what the what is your uh, dog up to these days, <laughs> all that stuff is it's just really good for relationship building. But um, but the what did I learn this year actually is th that like caught me off guard. I was like, wow, I've been so entrenched in just kind of getting business back and we've hired employees. Um, I think the one thing that I learned this year was I had more systems in place than I realized I did. And systems go a long way. And I was convinced for a long time that I just, I don't know, I just, I figured out how to do it and it worked. And I don't know how I'm going to convince somebody else to do the same thing. And then when we started hiring employees and I was trying to figure out how to teach them certain things, I was like, well, I, I guess I really do kind of roadmap the first three sessions a certain way. I guess I really do create that initial assessment evaluation consultation a certain way. I guess I do have more of a system approach than I thought I did. So now it's getting that stuff down on paper. So that way I'm not just racking my brain over how do I do what I do on a daily basis? Um, I just, I enjoy training people and that's, so now all of a sudden I'm being asked to like have other people do the same thing. So understanding that even though you may not realize you have like systematic things in play, you probably do. So it's good to start understanding what you do on a daily basis. So that way, when you do scale your business, it's a little bit easier to say, look, this is what I do and this is what works. In my consulting work, going from one person to more than one person is always the most difficult step. And it's for that systems reason that yep. you're talking about. All right. Mason. Uh, I would say two things. One, for sure, agree with Kristen because we're talking about retention here, right? And mm. being able to actually know who your customer is on a deeper level than just the, a transactional level. I think that is one of the number one things to increase retention in general. Uh, definitely makes the conversation easier when you want to keep that relationship going and that that uh, transaction going as well. So I, I think for me, I would say managing by the numbers, by doing that more, um, I would say whatever numbers are important, it might be active trainees, it might be operating capacity to make sure you're filling all your spots, all your sessions, uh, whatever that metric is, I think staying true to that metric is something I wish I would have done more. Um, like Kristen said, I wish I, I knew it, but I should have employed it even more, especially with very important decisions. Uh, so for me, I, I would say managing by the numbers and making sure that I'm looking at those metrics that matter and abiding by those and making my decisions based off of what those numbers say. Hmm. You just gave me an idea, something that we rarely talk about in martial arts, something that is is often not discussed in most service-based, especially fitness movement related disciplines is this idea of what's the most powerful word in marketing? It's no, but how often does a martial arts school, does a personal training facility, does a dance school say, we're full, we don't have room for you. And yet you're talking about operating capacity. Every martial arts school I know would say, you know what, when, I, when my kids class, when my adult class, when the ratios get beyond this, I know the quality suffers. How do you build to that? So I, I'm going to turn it right back around to you and then we'll go around. How do you determine your operating capacity? How many people you can have at a given camp or clinic? So going back to my first answer, and I, I, I like that question a lot, I'm still digging into the numbers to see, 
okay, at 10 people, for, for myself personally, because basketball is a team sport, so we, we need more people in the sessions to really benefit and see the growth with the randomness and the variability of the sport. So I can handle more people, let's say eight to 10 people on my own and still have a quality session. And I, I talk to parents to get feedback. We have weekly feedback calls. So uh, I try to get that gauge to make sure that that's always an accurate number. But then when you start to bring on teammates, part, uh, when we have we have five five to six part-time teammates who, who help train, when you start bringing somebody else on, there's an economy of scale where, you know, you might bring someone else on, but it's not really profitable to bring them on for, the only one extra person or two extra people. So I'm still trying to figure that out myself to learn what is the ideal number, the ratio that we have to where even by having the overhead of another teammate participate, we're still profitable for the revenue per employee. Um, I would say that we actually are in that situation for the first time ever. We're over capacity mm. and are, we have a waiting list right now. So I'm, I'm testing right now to see, okay, with this waiting list, will this lead to better retention or will it lead to more people in what is our lowest seasonality coming up in November through February? So hopefully that's a, that answers the question. I'm trying to be concise yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Waiting lists, I think are, are something that is so valuable. It gives you an ability to go back and say, okay. We just opened up capacity. We have a new session, whatever it is, who wants it? If you do it right, those fill pretty quickly. Chris, and I saw you nodding your head through a good portion of that. Some, some synergy there for you? Yeah, well, we're, have, we're having a similar um, at capacity or full kind of thing with, um, with our programming in a school. If children want to dance, they dance. So we just keep adding teachers to kind of fill that. It's, it's hard um, hiring qualified people to do some of that. So lead teachers, co-teachers, assistants. Um, I have a hard time with the no thing. Like, you know, like having having more kids is like a great, is a good problem to have, right? Um, and their strength in number, right? And then you go to your donors and foundation people and say, we have more children that want to dance and, and they want to support it. Um, so, when we we're talking about getting on a stage, I'm limited at 300 children um, by fire code. So sometimes, sometimes it's you know it's not my doing necessarily. But really, um, to our point, the, the quality of teaching and, and the relationship with the kid or the participant. Um, yeah, you want to kind of keep that in mind. I mean, I just. We had a class this afternoon, um, two teachers, a musician, and 42 children. And and depending on the age of the children, so right, eighth graders are a little more aware, have situational awareness and physical awareness of their bodies in space. Um, fourth grade boys and girls, like they, they're gonna like bump into each other and figure stuff out. Um, so you, yeah, it's all kind of relative to the age and, um, and the space in the room and who I can hire. But I just, I kind of like the idea of, oh, we've got 60 kids, let's hire two more teachers and just make another class if possible. Greg, yeah. you were, how, how long were you solo before you had employees? Oh gosh, um, I oh, think, I, so I, I was I'm working as an independent contractor as early as 2013. And then when I opened my brick and mortar, I decided to bring on one employee, but I was really still just kind of doing it on my own type of thing. Um, and, and I so, think every business owner kind of goes through this and it's like, yeah. wait, more, more clients are good. So I'm, I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum as it pertains to the space because I focus on one-on-one -on -one in very, very small group training. Uh, so the problem is the only way to add people is to add hours for me. And I'm sure a lot of people can understand 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. That's my hours. It's not working nine to five. It's working five to nine. And the problem is that's that's not a way to run a business. And I'll be the first to say, again, getting back into it, I'm still working way more hours than I should be. So it's our capacity. We made some changes in our facility to make a little bit more open space because what we want to provide is that still kind of concierge one-on-one -on -one connection with people, but still have the ability to have kind of the shared group. I want to make sure that they know what my coaching style is so I can talk to two or three people in a room and still cue them. Now, don't get me wrong. Like I love boot camps when it comes to fitness and you can, there's dozens of them, if not thousands of them around, depending on where you live. 
but we do want to have that individualized focus on certain clients that need that extra attention, that extra body awareness coming back from an injury, maybe at a high level of sports performance, uh, something that they need that little extra awareness. So when you get to that point, once, once you've lost that personal connection in a personal training business, it's, it's just group fitness. So we, we need to kind of make sure that when we bring a certain amount of people in, and we have some people that just, they desire more energy, they desire more um, attention. And we need to make sure we don't put too many of those people together. So a lot of it is just manipulating who's in the in the gym at once, because everyone who comes in here is being coached by an instructor. It's not an open gym. It's not a boot camp uh, style uh, fitness facility. So ours really kind of goes a lot on personalities and relationship versus uh, mass quantity numbers. Mm -hmm. right. Kristen, you're talking about adding instructor. All, all three of you are talking about adding staff, adding instructors, coaches, etc. In a lot of martial arts schools, and I expect in what all of you do as well, there's a word of mouth element that's pretty strong. And that means that you know, there's a virality to what you do. I would imagine if you start in a new school, it's probably the first, that core group is probably the hardest to generate, but you get more and then you get more and you get more because you, you've gotten more. And one of you call, referred to it as a, a great problem to have it, Greg. I think you call it a, a good problem to have. It certainly is to be over capacity, but sometimes that can be met with resistance from parents or sometimes the participants themselves as they, rec they, they start to feel whether or not it's accurate that maybe they're not getting the same quality, the same individualized attention. Can you speak to that? Yeah, um, part of our, um, our model of teaching is knowing children's names and really and giving them that individual attention even in a class so our our goal in every class is to have seen heard connected with each student at least two or three times um, and putting them into small groups and then putting them back together um, our summer camps and our intensives and um, pop-up weekends kind of feed that extra thing that some children need so that they're doing something extra um, that's maybe a little bit smaller. But when we go into a new school, uh, we always have children that have done something else in our programming and they know what we're doing and what we're doing and how we're doing it. And they're, they're the word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And those families that have connected with us through summer intensives or um, three-day vacation camps, um, they come in and say, oh, this is great. You're going to love it. And then we work to make sure that that's the, the same experience they have. They're early on, and I've been doing this for 20 years. Early on, we had an experience where there were just too many children with not enough um, leaders seeing and hearing and really giving the children a great experience in one, in one occasion. We learned it real quickly that that was, you know, what and the children would like? say, the, the children will say, I don't feel like I matter here. Mm. Um, and, and again, that happened once and we, we wanted to make sure um, that they did feel like they mattered and that their presence was important and that they were part of a big story, but definitely um, seen. So um, we just pulled them apart a little bit and not shoved them all on stage together, but gave, gave them more space and room. And we've had to kind of split the programming over the years. So like the, the mothership, our National Dance Institute in New York City started with um, a few hundred children. And within three years, it had grown into a thousand children in Madison Square Garden. And right. And so then what they did, because it's a it's a sporty dance. It's a very mm. like, again, very accessible thing. Um, and it's fun. It's just kids have fun. So it grew so quickly that they just split it apart in even in New York City. So there's six thousand kids dancing in New York City and nine thousand in New Mexico and um little corner of New Hampshire, four thousand. Awesome. So and then, yeah. So, yeah, you just, I think it's just important to um, just step back and look at that. And I, I think I've heard others say it, like, take the temperature, hear, hear from your families, you know, what are your kids saying and, and um, surveys. Hmm. 
um, when, you know, exit kind of interview surveys, like what was, what was the greatest experience you had this year with, with our programming, or if you could change one thing, what would it be? Um, and hear, you know, hearing from them. Yeah. And, and that, thank you. It's almost like I, I owe you 20 bucks because you gave me the best segue of all time. Myson, you, you mentioned <laughs> weekly feedback calls and that, that hit me enough that I jotted it down. I wanted to come back to it. So there it is. Uh, what, what does that look like? We'll talk about that for a moment, if you would. So we uh, send a mass text to the parents and there's a link in that mass text for them to schedule a call with mm -hmm. me to just get an update on their kid, how they've been doing, what the next steps are. And honestly, I, I like to use it to nerd in one nest and uh, uh, tell me. Uh, and what I've lately started doing is, and I'm glad Kristen has brought this up, I've been listening to the culture code and some of the things that Kristen's talking about are like in that book, belonging, mm -hmm. kids want to feel like, or trainees or players want to feel like they belong, they're safe, and they have a future together. And what Kristen is saying is is spot on. So we've been changing a lot of things that we've done because of that. But for the weekly feedback calls, um, parents just want to hear times I get their advice, their thoughts, and what it really has been doing to kind of tie the word of mouth marketing into play too, is really giving me the verbatim knowledge and words to use in our advertising and our marketing mm -hmm. that we've gotten a return on. So the parent says, I like that you have positive accountability. You don't let them slack off, but you do it in a, a great way. His other coach, and I, I'm, I'm starting to listen to some more keywords and those calls are recorded and they know they're recorded too. So I like to go listen back or the teammate listen to them. And he uses those exact words to make sure that we have the most effective copywriting in our marketing. Hmm. Awesome. Greg, looked like you had about six things running through your brain. I, have, um, um, I, I love conversations like this. I have like a million things it. running through my brain. No, well, so again, coming from a little bit of a different, like I think the, first of all, I think youth fitness, however they take that through dance, through martial arts, through basketball, through just getting out in the park and playing is so big. And so like, I only work with a small set of, of juniors and a lot of it is still on a, either a, um, a one-on-one, -on -one, or I think our biggest junior golf fitness class was eight kids. Um, and it's really, it's, it's playtime. It's fun. So I the, like making sure that everyone's on the same page, the fun is being had, but then going back to the original question of, of potentially getting overloaded and our only marketing for years was just word of mouth. That was it because a, I didn't know how to market B I'm not good at social media. And I was really, really fortunate enough to have clients that just said how wonderful I was. But the problem is, I, to this day, I'm still getting people that are coming to look to work for Greg Johnson with Greg Johnson. Mm -hmm. And the issue as we bring on new people or as you bring on new coaches to help, they need to understand. And that's where my system started like, oh, OK, now this makes sense. Because now in our gym, we, we make sure people are coming to Veramax Fitness. They're coming to train at Veramax Fitness. They're not coming to train with Greg. Mm -hmm. They're not coming to train with uh, Chris or Sam or Angie or Curtis or other trainers. I'm going on a much overdue long needed vacation next week and I get to trust all my clients with my other trainers and they know they're going to get a very very similar feel they we all have similar philosophies we might have different methods and in a best case scenario some of my clients who really like me might like them and say you know their 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 schedule works pretty well Greg do you mind if I if I and oh no 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 please do I appreciate that so that's where the systems come into play and we want to build those coaches up to be our equals that way, because again, when people bring in new coaches, new facilitators, you want to make sure that wherever those those kids or adults go, they're getting the same field, they're getting the same approach, they still feel part of the same program. Um, and like sometimes it, it takes saying, well, actually, you know, I know you're a basketball player. So Curtis, actually, he, he's got 14 years experience in basketball. Like he may be able to help you with that meniscus issue that, that we've always been talking about. So make, giving them, make them be the expert of, of things that, that, that they know. And it allows them to go, Hey, you know, maybe I will try a couple of sessions with this other trainer and they're still in the facility. I, like I haven't lost a, a, a client. Ideally I've maybe gained a couple extra sessions a week or a month for that situation. Or maybe say, Hey, this other guy that I play basketball with also has a meniscus issue. So you should see Curtis too type of thing. Mm. 
I want to talk about fun, Greg, you, you used the word fun. And I, I was saying I, I was uh, at a class last night and had nothing to do with movement. Uh, it was actually firearms and was talking with the instructor because as an, as an instructor, I'm constantly evaluating other instructors. What can I pull? How do I learn from what you were doing? And the thing that this gentleman does that is amazing is he always makes it fun. Doesn't matter what we're doing, how we're doing, it's fun. And it reinforces something that I've always said to instructors. If you make it fun first, if it's fun and they learn anything, something, if you can check those two boxes, they will keep coming back. They will keep learning. So I'm going to start with you, Kristen. What role does fun play in what you do and what you organize and put out? It's the top of it. it it's a, absolutely the top of it. Um, fun silly, um, lightheartedness, uh, encouragement, joy, like joy is really, really important, not just happy, but joyful, um, made my heart so happy. Um, this past summer, I asked children, I said, what did you learn today? And a kid said, I learned that hard work is fun. And it blew my mind because this, isn't this what we want more than anything is for people, everybody, please, everybody to understand that the harder I work and the more I pr pursue excellence in my job and my relationships and in just in getting up, making my bed in the morning, um, you know, keeping consistency and routine um, that you can feel really good and you can make it fun and funny. Um, so what Greg was saying about systems and, and having things kind of in place, what happened was um, 40 some odd years ago, uh, Jacques Dumboise was a, um, the New York City Ballet's premier dancer. And if you don't know him, Google Jacques Dumboise. He was an amazing ballet dancer. Um, and his children were getting into some trouble in school and you know talking about trouble in school ps whatever and he went into school said i want to teach a dance class to the boys boys need to understand that dance is athletic and there's there's a great way there's lots of things you can learn um i'm sorry my neighbor's about to knock on my door my dog is going to bark here it comes <laughs> <laughs> do, we, do we want to do you need to get that we can switch over to somebody else you should not always say <laughs> i like on such a hot topic too um, <laughs> um so basically what he wanted he wanted children to understand that um come here dog um that Dis the discipline of dance and sports anything athletic that can be applied to school and and um and life and he was teaching in a way for many years he was teaching in a way that he thought was obvious and teachers came along next to him and said you have a methodology this is actually a method of teaching that is brilliant and it includes humor and fun and joy and hilarity and silly voices and noises and and um you know just stupid lyrics and songs even um, and he and he was kind of confused by that. Like, doesn't everybody know how to teach like this? And yeah, they don't. Not everybody does. But but employing that that method and teaching it throughout, um, like you were saying to your point, Greg. Any of my teaching staff can we can have Wacky Wednesday where all the teachers move around and everybody gets somebody different. And the kids are like, she's just like you are, but different. And it is, but it's a very similar class and it's, there's consistency in it. Um, and they will consistently say that it was fun. Um, little boy that I had last year, we plucked him out of ISS. He was in school suspension, mm -hmm. some serious, like just anger issues. Um, the principal knew he needed to move. And so she got him out of ISS, brought him to me. Um, and we had dance class and he was focused. He was um, completely engaged. And at the end of the class came up to me and said, that was so fun. And he's he's not in ISS anymore. He's oh, like, great. he's gotten like scholarships to go and do oh. great things this year. Um, but it was fun, yeah, it's so important. It's so important. And 
to weave the hard work into it. And they're sweating and they're like breathing heavily. Their faces are red and they're like, this is so awesome. Yeah. So yeah, it's important. So important. Myson, where does, where does fun fit in? And if I, if I chop up, can you let me know? I want to get them on my phone because I, I'm enjoying this too much to, to let it interfere with the, the conversation. Um, so I would say I agree with Greg and Kristen, the fun and, and I kind of like to add a slash serious to it because I, I I'm so I weird my trainees. I I am a weird coach. I scream at the top of my lungs sometimes. I coach as hard as I can, and we make sure that there is a fulfilling nature to it because I've burned out before in other sports, especially basketball. And it's just it's not fun to to compete when you're burned out mentally and physically. So I make sure that there is a fun and fulfilling component to it as well. Um, and you know most kids aren't going to the NBA or to play college basketball. So what can we pull from this aside from just getting a scholarship? So try to make it fun to where we can teach things that are intangible that they would love to have off the court or parents love the kids to have off the court as well. But I will say there, I think it kind of goes as a synonym to hard working that fun slash serious is important too, because we do have certain trainees who want to play in college. We do have trainees, one's going to the NBA, one plays, a couple play high major division one, and they need that serious nature too. So uh, like Kristen said too, with small groups, we've had to segment certain groups that here's the fun, fun group, here's the fun, serious group. And if anybody's in this kind of serious, serious category, those are the ones where we have to talk to them and, and try to just light the mood up and say, you can still pursue excellence, but have fun while you're doing it and, and delight in that journey. So I think it's everything. I think it is the foundation and, and we joke and say fundamentals. So the, the, we kind of <laughs> capitalize the F-U-N in the fundamentals to make sure it's always, and we start with that. One of the things that I've said often to school owners, if it's not fun, they don't come back. You don't get the opportunity to work with them. You don't get the opportunity to better them, help them, et cetera. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure enough about what each of you does, but something that comes out of martial arts quite often is we have a tradition, we have these lineages, we have these uh, oftentimes codified sets of movement that are of importance. And sometimes the instructional styles will prioritize those. It's gotta be done this way, it's gotta be done right. And fun kind of trickles down on the priority list. And in the modern era, we have a bit of a battle going on. Some might term it, you know, fun versus tradition or quality. And there we go. All right, we got five for a moment. We'll be down to four again. Perfect, appreciate it. Um, and I I would rather see, I, I've, I've been, I've gone on record to say this. I've been quite firm that, you know, sometimes you have to make a compromise. Sometimes you have to let something go because if it me if if you if you draw that hard line, if fun isn't the priority and they leave, they're not into it. How do you help them? How do you how do you get somebody better at anything if they're not there? Right. So if I if I may tag on to that, absolutely. Uh, I think in any business or educational model. Um, you have to look at what is the objective? Mm -hmm. What is the objective? Like, what is your finish line? What is your goal? Um, and if it is, if it's to have fun, you know, that's a, that's one thing. If it is to get this move perfected, that, that's another thing can you blend the, the two things through your method of teaching the perfected? The answer is yes. Um, but um, if what is the objective? If your objective is retention, then you better have figured out how to get the two mm -hmm. together. Um, in, in the case for, um, in the case of performance, uh, we're gonna put kids in front of hundreds of people and we're going to do that and make sure they do not fail. 
Um, so we make a promise to them that they're going to feel built up and excited about what they're about to do. And um, they're going to tackle something that they never thought they could do. And, and then we get them to that. So they know what the objective is. We know what the objective is. We agree that that's the objective. And then we work over time to get there. Um, so yeah, I know it, it is hard. I mean, I'm also speaking from um, a, a dance education program in schools and not a ballet school. Right. That right, and so that's where like you're talking about, uh, Myson. You're talking about like the serious, serious, um, the people that have the feet, or they have the chops, the talent. They they want this really structured thing that's going to take them somewhere. Um, still, I think it's important, as you said, to layer some things in. What is what is the objective, and and try and meet it. Yeah, Greg. From from what I understand hearing conversations with personal trainers, you end up with a, a, at least a notable chunk of people who are fairly high functioning and they come in and they want to be, they, they want everything. They want linear progress. They want to make sure they're putting weight on week after yeah. week. And, you know, you're, you're trying to keep them safe. You're doing a lot of different things. How do you make it fun while you're navigating all those other things? Yeah, I got news for you. The fitness industry is a train wreck. <laughs> 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 um, like, like it, it is. It is kind of fun to like to get to talk with, with with other industries. And I would encourage anybody to go outside your industry more. Go to events that don't involve your industry. But um, I, I want to start by jumping back on something that uh, my son said. Uh, burnout is real in every industry, mm -hmm. and if it's not fun for you as a coach, it's really hard to make it fun for your clients, for your students. So at some point, sometimes you do need to make sure that you are taking care of yourself so that way you still enjoy what you're doing. I mentioned to, to Jeremy earlier, sometimes we just get into these things because it's our passion, um, but we don't really know the, the, the ins and outs of what to do. When it comes to, to fitness, like I am I am very foundational, very traditional when it comes to, to training. Like there's certain things that the human body should be able to do, a hinge, a squat, a horizontal push and pull, a rotation. That's great. Now, on the other side of it, there's hundreds of ways to do every one of those movements. And I always kind of bring it to the point of if I have an hour with somebody, like I'm it, somewhere in that half hour that I'm going to sneak in everything that they need. But the rest of that is fair game to make it as fun as possible. And you also have to remember parents and adults want to have fun, too. Like you could sit there with your clipboard and focus on, OK, we're doing uh, three sets of 12 reps with 85 percent of your max uh, of this, 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 that's all fine and dandy. But if, if they're not kind of like entertained, like, like excited about it, then you need to make sure that they are in other ways. A lot of things that I was implementing for my kids, I, for random reasons, I decided to throw into my adults programming and they were like, this is amazing. Like, I love this. You, you add the challenge you add, we have, um, different games, like gamifying type of things like that. And all of a sudden they're challenging each other. They're like, hey, like I remember Mike was here two weeks ago and he got 24 reps of this, this, and this. What, what's he on now? And these people don't even know each other. So it's just like adding in, like this is a whole nother aspect of it, but adding like the technology side of things or the number side of things or the charts. Like there's, we have a, a heart rate monitor system that we use and everyone's constantly looking at the board. Who, who has the most maps? Who has the most points? They don't even know these people. They just know, I want to I want to be in the top 10. I want to be in, so it's like, adding a little bit of something to their training. So my job as a coach is to, yeah, it's great to have fun, but what good is fun is if you're, if you're not losing weight when you're trying to lose weight, if you're not getting stronger when you're trying to get stronger. So there's the, the balance there of, am I giving them enough of what they need and enough of what they want to where they're getting the results they want, enjoying it while they, they're, they're here. And also hopefully talking about it a little bit when they leave here too. The other, the other one thing that I kind of bring up when we talk about the stuff with the fun is I work with golfers. Uh, when, if you've got, if you guys have ever played youth sports, golf was probably not one of the top sports. When you're playing soccer, there's games, there's this that, and the other thing with golf, you're just sitting in line, hitting a ball. And if you're in golf fitness, this is the most boring thing in the world. So my job when I work with golfers is I need to make golf fitness fun. 
But the reality is I'm just helping develop athletes. I'm running, jumping, hopping, skipping, throwing. And oh, by the way, that rotation might actually help you hit the ball farther type of stuff. So it's like, it's getting like stuff that, and that's why golf was losing hundreds of kids, thousands of kids a year because it's boring. So like you, what you want to make sure is like that your programming doesn't become so boring and so regimented and so fine tuned that people leave. I played competitive football for 14 I want, years. I want to be able to draw a box around what you just said for the last 10 seconds <laughs> and just make a soundboard out of it. And I think <laughs> just hammer that, please continue. Yeah. So like, I, like when I stopped playing football, the last thing I wanted to do was back squats, heavy deadlifts and bench press. <laughs> I was over it. I was exhausted with it. And my fitness just kind of went like this for years because I had no idea what I, what, I, what I wanted to do. I'd gain weight, lose weight, try cardio. And then now I've redeveloped that to where now I've built that back into my personal workouts and I enjoy it, but it's not the end all be all of my workouts. Um, so it's just like, it's finding what it can, and as, as you go through clients, as especially if you're working with kids and kids start getting older, their ideas of their body are going to change. I constantly have 14 year olds in here is flexing their muscles in the mirror. I'm like, yes, I know. I get it. Like, good for you. Now let's, let's keep going. So it's, and, and I'll, I'll let them do that because it's fun. I'll also threaten to put it on social media, but you never know. So, but it's, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a constant balance of kind of like you were saying is like that all the traditional foundational stuff. But it is okay to introduce some of the modern era things, and you can you can have that balance for sure. So we're going to kind of bookend. We started this conversation with you know wh what have you learned this year that really made a difference for you? Let's open that up even wider. What's the best piece of advice? It's probably something that you hear in the back of your head, time and time again. You're like, oh, I can't forget this. I can't forget this. That you're telling yourself. Maybe you're telling your staff. Maybe you're telling the students, the kids, the, the clients. What is that bit that has really been your, your compass as you've built what you're doing? Myson. Hoping you didn't start with me, and you did. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, would, I would say um, it kind of goes back to what we just talked about with fun. Find satisfaction in the work that we're putting in. You know, and I think that's why someone said this in when I was talking to them, they said, you know, you're helping people graduate to the next degree. And I thought, okay, and it plays on the Hooch University name for the for the business, but it really is about graduating to that next area of fulfillment as we strive and honestly grind or sculpt, however you want to say it, to the next level, to whatever brain chemistry it is that we're going for, like Kristen said, whatever objective that we have. So I think having satisfaction as we sweat on the court, as we do that next uh, next routine, and we go over the same choreograph that we've done for the last three hours. My wife is watching Dance with the Stars right now, and it's like, I'm, I'm amazed watching this thing, seeing these people, uh, seeing how these stars are working only with one week and how many hours they put into it. And I know what it's like to be burned out from running sprints and playing basketball and just need, needing something that's novel and new. So I, I would say find satisfaction in the work that we're putting in uh, as we strive for that excellence. I think that wraps everything up in, from a philosophical and, and physiological level for, for us, for what I would say, the best advice that I have received is well, well said because you can't have the satisfaction without knowing what the goal is right to to piggyback onto what you said chris I'll, I'll save you for last greg how about you what's the what's the best thing you've heard i think the the, the biggest thing i the biggest thing i've learned over what feels like decades um like i i used to think i was in the fitness business and then then i thought well we're not really in the fitness business we're in the customer service business mm -hmm. And then I would now, again, like as I'm trying to, to coach other coaches, we're in the relationships business. We're in the business of developing relationships. Um, you could have all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't connect with someone on a deeper level, because when someone first comes into my studio, they may say, yeah, I want to lose weight. Yeah, I want to get stronger. But until I start to understand why they want to lose weight and why they want to get stronger, I'll have a harder time training them. So. When I say developing relationships, it starts when you first, first, first meet that person and you learn as much about them as possible, even though it may have nothing to do with their fitness goals. And when you talk with them, you know their dog's name, you know how their parents are doing, you know what 
truly, truly drives them, what makes them them. We are absolutely in a relationships business. And I think that's literally how I've, I've built the business that I have is I've had the opportunity to connect with so many people. And now introducing these, these new players to my team is that's my big point is, hey, when you come into the gym, gym don't just set up for your client and go like, say hi to someone, mm-hmm. ask them how their kid's doing. Cause like our, the, we have kids that we're only seeing a chunk of the year because they could be going to school, they could be in golf tournaments. So I wanna make sure I connect with them. So that way, when they come back in town, they're coming back to me because they, they know me, they know what we do and they know we're here for them, whether they're in town, out of town or indifferent. So it's just, it's relationships. Well said. Kristen. Could not agree more with Greg and Lyson. Amazing. Like all of my words. Also, I want to just say that I like you people. I think you're really fun. (laughs) Um, If you ever feeling like burnt out and you're like, I got to just do something completely crazy and different, I will come and give you a dance class and you will have a great time in your, in your stuff. But honestly, I was getting, I've been teaching a long, long time and I was getting burnt out on, um, creating movement and I needed some repetitive strike. So I took up running um, and I'm running my fifth marathon at the end of this month and do a Marine Corps. Um, my daughter's a CrossFit coach. So she's got me back squatting stuff. It's really great fun, but it has definitely broadened my relationships with my students. So I can talk to the cross country kids about their running in relation to mine. Um, and as soon as I had started running, my friends got me into triathlons. So then I had to get on a bike and a wetsuit and just do things that scared me. Um, and it, it changed up my game and it, it definitely took me out of feeling burnt out from doing one thing and, um, and made my relationships really strong with my, with my students, no matter what age they were. And, I think too, if if I'm going to ask them to be excellent and give their very best work, I better bring it too. Like I, no matter what's going on in my life and um, what's of concern, I need to drop it at the door. We know this, but you drop it at the door and you go in and give your excellent work to them. Because like Greg said, um, and my son was also saying, we're not growing, like I'm not growing dancers. I'm growing humans. Mm-hmm. You're not growing golfers, you're growing humans. You're not growing basketball players or martial artists. We're helping grow people and you're meeting them wherever they are. If they're 30 years old and they wanna take up whatever they wanna take up, you're meeting them where they are and and getting them to another level, like Myson was saying. And what an incredibly rewarding life we get to have doing that. It's, It's really, it's really awesome. And we, when we I kind of go into classes and interactions with our, our clients that way, they know it. They know it and they feel built up as a result. They sure do. Uh, I yeah. want to thank all of you for, for coming on, for doing this. This has been awesome. Let's go around, start back up with, with you, Kristen. If people want to get a hold of you or learn more about NHDI, like mm-hmm. where can yeah, they Yeah, Mike wants to take dance class. I, I do. And look, hey, I, I'm big on following up and credibility. So like, look, if, if you can teach me how to dance, it can be even Zoom. I won't make you drive all the way to Dreamville. I'm for it. <laughs> Easy. Easy. With my eyes closed upside down underwater, I can do it. Um, no, you can get uh, you can get me at NHDI at NHDI.org. Look, I'm wearing my shirt. There you go. Um, but you can also Kristen at NHDI.org. Um, but it's really fun. Like if you look up you can YouTube it too and see some, some, some pretty cool interviews with kids. Nice. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course, Greg, how can they find you? Yeah. The easiest would be on Instagram G Johnson fit, or I think I'm still on Facebook, maybe even MySpace. Uh, (laughs) So I'm not allowed to use MySpace anymore. (laughs) If anyone, if anyone contacts you on MySpace, I want them to, I want you to tell me. (laughs) <laughs> uh, but I, my, my gym is Veramax Fitness. I'll throw up the shirt as well because it's a weird spelling, V-A-R-I, VeramaxFitness.com. Uh, and by all means, hit me up on social media. I have the, the great, great opportunity to, to present all over the country and train other coaches. So I'll be in Washington, D.C., L.A., Las Vegas, uh, mm-hmm. and hopefully San Francisco as well. So uh, if you're in the industry, come hit me up. Myson. 
Instagram, my son Jones. So my son, M Y S O N, not your biological son, but my son Jones. Uh, if you Google that or go to Instagram, you can find me. Um, and I've enjoyed it. It's been an honor. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. And I have no doubt that how, wh whatever amount of time we had put on this, we could have filled it. So maybe based on some feedback, I can get you all back and we can we can have some more fo focused conversation. But I appreciate you all for being here, folks listening or watching, you know, check out what they've got going on. If there's at all any relevance to what you're doing individually, please find a way to support them. And that's it.